If you were to compare the federal deficit to the S&P 500 earnings, it's about a push. In other words, all the S&P 500 wow. earnings are just about what the federal deficit is. That's just nuts. That's amazing. Hello, I'm Ed D'Agostino. Welcome to Global Macro Update. This week, we dive into the energy markets and investing in China with my friend David Hay of Evergreen GavCal. David is Evergreen's chief investment officer and his 40 plus years worth of investment experience make him one of the people I pay close attention to when crafting my own thoughts on market themes. Before we start, be sure to subscribe to our channel, hit the notification bell, and leave us a comment after you've watched the video. Now let's spend a few great minutes with David Hay. You were introduced to me through Grant Williams. He uh, was one of my, my favorite analysts and, and financial thinkers. And right before he introduced you, he said, this guy is one of the good guys. I had him fool. That's all I can say. <laughs> well, you know, well, I asked him later, like, so yeah, I, David's a great guy. But what did you mean by that? He gave you, I think, what I would say is the highest compliment in this industry, which is that he, he said, David is uh, w one of the special advisors that cares more about his clients than how much money he's managing. And uh, I, 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 that always stuck with me. Um, so that's a phrase that I use sparingly now as one of the good guys, but, but you're one. So I'm happy to introduce you to the audience. I appreciate that very much, Ed. I'll try not to disappoint you here, but, uh, <laughs> yeah, I've been doing this a few years, you know, 45 years now. So, uh, maybe one of not just the good guys, more, maybe more just one of the long lasting guys. There's no substitute for experience. There's Charles Goff, you work with John Malden very closely and John's been around about that same length of time, but. There's not too many of us left, especially those that actually manage money. You know, yeah. uh, we age in dog years, you know, maybe a little more than dog years, portfolio <laughs> manager years. Well, you must have started when you were five because you look uh, right, you, you right. look pretty young. So I want to get into your thoughts, David. You're chief investment officer of a, of a very multi billion dollar firm. I want to get into your thoughts on the markets and 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 how you're thinking about them right now. And one of the things that I also want to chat with you about is the uh, what I call the I think the approach that a lot of financial media takes lately is they have guests on and say, what do you think, right? Uh, I think the Fed's going to cut rates. And uh, everybody comes on and argues whether they're going to cut or not. And it, it doesn't matter. Right. Right? Like, it, it's just, it's the most irrelevant way to start a financial conversation. So I'm going to try to resist that with you. And <laughs> yeah, instead, I appreciate that. <laughs> let's talk about kind of the, the things that really matter. What is top of mind for you right now when you're thinking about managing other people's money? Well, I guess I always try to think, what is the ultimate big picture? And, you know, to your point, it's very tough to predict the squiggles. I mean, I do these and, you know, with whomever, and they'll say, well, what do you think the stock market's going to do next week? Or what do you think corporate earnings should be like? And I say, well, I, you know, I have no idea, really. Let's just be honest about that. But I think it's easier to, especially given my, you know, 45 years in the business, having seen a lot of things, reading a lot of research from great sources like our friends at GavCal, and, uh, and many other, you know, I read, read you guys all the time. And you mentioned Grant Williams, you know, he's a uh, you know, superstar and, and uh, Luke Roman. I, I just go on on Jesse Felder. And, you know, I guess I'm kind of an information junkie. And so I, I'm trying to figure out what is the, the master trend, the mega trend. And uh, I mean, frankly, uh, I really agree with Neil Howe. And I'm hearing and seeing more people, some of whom are very bullish, uh, Darius Dale, brilliant guy from 42 Macro. He's very bullish near term, but he thinks we're in the fourth turning as well. And if you, so for those that don't know, and I'd highly recommend that anybody that hasn't gotten the book, The Fourth Turning is here. So this is the sequel to The Fourth Turning, which was written in the late nineties and actually was quite prescient. And I think this one is too. So this came out, I think two years ago, a year and a half ago, something like that. And it basically describes that we're in this kind of societal crisis phase that comes along every 80 to 90 years, something like this. So obviously there was a Great Depression in World War II, and that was about 80, 90 years ago. Now we're going through another fourth turning. And I think the evidence is all around us that we are in that. And yet we have a stock market that's acting like it's the second turning or at, at the latest, the third turning. So I'm actually, you know, you may not know this, and I wrote a book called Bubble 3.0 
which we published right at the beginning of 2022. I rushed it out the door, did it on Substack, because I wanted to be on record that I thought that we were going through the third bubble of the last 25 years, the first being the tech bubble, which we all know about in the late 90s. Then we had, as a follow-up to that, uh, the housing bubble, housing and mortgage uh, bubble. And then we've had the bubble 3.0, which hit its crescendo, I believe, in 2021. And they're all related because it was the reaction function to each of those bubbles bursting that then inflated the next bubble. And so now, you know, 2022 was obviously a devastating year. The NASDAQ was down 35%. It was the worst year for balanced portfolios since 1871. And yet here we are now in early 2024, and it's looking like things are great. In fact, I would argue it's an, an echo bubble. And so I'm actually thinking about doing an addendum to my book and, and call it The Great Disconnect, because there is, in my view, such a tremendous disconnect between you know, what's actual re real, which the financial markets are not. Financial markets, uh, you know, I guess in some ways you could say they drive fundamentals, but really at the end of the day, the, the financial markets are ultimately going to reflect fundamentals. Uh, and, you know, that's where you get into this deviation between near term and longer term. And that near term stuff is, you know, just all those factors that I don't think any human being can predict. But when you get to a situation where there's as much euphoria, optimism in financial markets, and then you look at the real world around you and you go, these two just don't fit. And I think that creates great opportunity for those that aren't so tied to benchmarks that they can't invest differently. But that's the tremendous pressure that you get under as a portfolio manager when you get these hot markets, which as you know, I, I don't have to explain this to you, it's been very narrower and it's getting narrower. And the Magnificent Seven is down to maybe the Magnificent Three or Four. You know, and Tesla is just, you know, that's, that's been one of my, it's really the only one of the Magnificent Sevens I've really been highly critical of, but uh, it, it is looking like it's coming unglued. So there's, there's the noise, there's the pressure to keep up with the, you know, the near term. And then there's, uh, you know, the longer term trend. And, you know, I still think that we're in this bubble phase that partially deflated in 2022, but has reinflated to a large degree since then. So anyway, that's just a little bit of a, you know, kind of a big picture view that I take. And so anything you want to ask, go for it. That sets the stage perfectly. Thank you. Well, so with, with that as our backdrop, let's dig into some, some individual sectors. Um, the first of which I'd like to get into is energy. Talk about risk, right? And, and heading into some potentially dark times. I mean, I, I spent a lot of time focused on geopolitics and it feels really dangerous right now. Uh, and obviously there's a lot going on and, and one of the most head scratching elements of being an investor right now, from my perspective is everything that's going on in the Middle East. And yet oil is just sort of hanging out in the seventies. Uh, it, it, it's remarkable. What are your thoughts on, uh, on energy, but specifically with gas and oil to start? Sure. Well, you may not know this, but I get kind of pigeonholed as a perpetual, you know, perma energy bull. And yes. The, the MLP guy, right? The MLP guy. And, you know, ironically, <laughs> MLPs were up 25% last year. Yeah. Yeah. In a year when energy, I forget what XLE was down, but it was down double digits. Uh, the year before, it was up 56% in 2022 in that nightmare year. People kind of forget about that. So energy's actually been on a great roll, and that was one of my favorite letters that we put out back at the end of 2020. It was called Totally Toxic, and it basically compared the energy industry to the tobacco industry because so much of Wall Street believed that energy was uninvestable at that point, at least you know, old-fashioned traditional energy as opposed to green energy. And what's amazing is if you were to do a chart overlay of how has green energy done since then versus fossil. For a while, green energy did somewhat better, but then, you know, it's been in a nosedive. <clears throat> so, but you're right. There's this is another one, what I'd call a great disconnect. And many people look at the energy market and say, why, how can this be happening when you've got this kinetic war in the Middle East and you've got, uh, the, you know, what look to be and truly are very low inventories, uh, and it's like, well, how can how can this be happening? There's obviously something wrong with the, the oil market that it's not responding. But what I think is it, there's a, a few factors that get greatly overlooked. And this is including by my friend Doomberg, who you know, and you may be aware of this rather controversial stance he's taken here lately. And I've read some of the comments pushing back against him. Some have been very polite and thoughtful. Others have been, frankly, I think, really just cheap shots And because he's a bright guy. 
But his basic point is, hey, we've got plenty of energy. We're in, a, in an era of energy abundance. And I don't agree. I don't agree with that either. I think the, I think the demand for the projections for, for energy demand moving forward are grossly under underestimated. I mean, the, the demand is going to surge for a number of reasons. Totally agree with that. I think particularly in the developing world. And, you know, this what's a shocker, if you really want to see somebody that's still, or an entity that has been embarrassingly off the mark, the International Energy uh, Administration has been a joke for decades, really. They have chronically underestimated demand, and yet they're considered to be, they are considered to be the authority on the energy market, which is unfortunate because they just, they're very politicized for one thing. And they also don't look at the developing world. That's where the growth has come from. It's true in the developed world, the demand for fossil fuels has actually gone down somewhat, but it's grown, you know, very significantly in the developing world. And I think we'll continue to do so. Uh, so there's, but you know, the other part of it is that if we look at things, well, and the other point was Russia, you know, geez, look, we've lost all this Russian oil and gas and how come that hasn't driven prices up? Well, we really haven't lost any Russian oil. Oil, right. they get the oil to market. Now they're discounting, but that oil is going to market. <clears throat> and also, if you look at the war in the Middle East, there's been very little impact on oil shipments. There's been significant impacts on freight shipments through the Suez Canal. Right. So there's really been so far no impact from either one of those items, which, you know, before they happen, you might have thought, well, yeah, oil is going to go up. But there hasn't been a supply impact. Now, the other thing that I think is greatly underappreciated is this I, this issue of, well, before I even go there, let's, let's think about the SPR. So we've had massive releases from the Strategic Petroleum Reserve, and those have stopped. They stopped last June, I believe. And actually, once they stopped, oil ran hard. Oil was in the 60s last June. It went to 95 right. and by the end of September. Then it's corrected hard once again. Uh, but uh, the other issue that has, is really kind of masking, because the oil bears also bring up the fact that U.S. production has been quite resilient. And it did have a good production year last year, for sure. The reality is we're barely above where we were in 2019. And our oil our great oil miracle that we've had in this country over the last 15 years has almost exclusively come from the shales. And, you know, that's the much hated fracking, right? right. Horizontal drilling, you know, injection of sand and water into the, into the wells. And it's why we went from, we were producing somewhere around 4 million barrels a day of oil and I think 60 billion cubic feet a day of gas. And now we're at about 115, 120 billion cubic feet of gas and we're 13 million barrels of oil. Uh, as our friends at Gary and Rosenzweig like to point out, we've basically found almost three Saudi Arabias between oil and natural gas in this country over the last 15 years. It's absolutely astounding. Yeah. It should we, we should be so proud of our energy industry, and yet it's been vilified, as you know. But the problem with it is that it is uh, has a high decline rate, particularly the oil. Oil declines at about these fracked wells are very easy to find. But after two years, they're about 80 percent, 70 percent. It's about 40 percent per year. So, you know, do the math. It actually works wow. out more like two thirds, let's say, decline rate after two years. Uh, so you have to keep drilling. How, and yet the drilling rate count is down. I mean, we look at our production is right. almost well, it really is at a slight record with a, a down rate count. How's that happen? OK, now this is where the other thing that, that really bothers me that just doesn't get the attention it deserves is something called drilled but uncompleted wells. So when COVID hit. There, there had actually had been strong drilling activity up to that point. So you had a bunch of wells, I mean, thousands of wells, kind of think of them like partially completed homes. And the, the producer said, stop. Be like Lenar saying, OK, we've got these homes half built. Stop because the market has died. We're going to wait till the market conditions approve. So you had this huge backlog of drilled but uncompleted wells that have been drawn down drastically. And hardly ever do you see a chart of that. And if you do see a chart of it, you see it overall for the U.S. You don't see hardly ever. I've only found one source that came up with this, which is the drop in DUCs in the Permian. And the Permian is, as you know, the most important shale basin in America. You could argue it's the most important in the world, maybe uh, along with Saudi Arabia, Bihar. But it's that's where the, the DUCs were very high and have absolutely crashed. And they're down so low, it's hard to believe they can go any lower. Once that reality sinks in, I think there's going to be a tremendous wake up call that we don't have enough production. So it's, you know, I think this whole thing's been delayed. There's been some very unusual factors at work. 
Uh, you know, it's kind of this residual of COVID that I think has had, uh, you know, effects across many parts of the economy where it's, it's just created so many distortions that have still not been fully worked off. But I agree with you. I think oil is going to have another, you know, monster move to the upside. And I do think there's political pressure to keep the price of oil down for obvious reasons. I mean, the SPR was sure. a brazen effort to do that. Right. But I think there's more subtle efforts. I mean, the, the futures market for oil is something like 30 times the cash market. So if somebody with deep pockets is playing around in the futures market, they can they can create some near term weakness that doesn't reflect fundamentals. But ultimately, the fundamentals will out. Moving from petroleum products over to alternative types of, of fuel, how do you feel about nuclear? Because, you know, the, the work that we've been doing is, you know, it's just at some point we have to go there and the government probably needs to jumpstart that that process to to, to get it moving. Well, how about just not opposing it? How about, I mean, get they, out I, of the way. My right? joke is yeah. they, they should call the NRC the ANRC for Anti-Nuclear Regulatory <laughs> Commission. I mean, they, they've only approved one, uh, you know, new plants or two plants, actually, but there were one project local in, in Georgia over the last 25 years or more, really even go back to the 70s. There was one other plant that wanted to operate. It had been approved before the NRC was formed. It, basically, we have been, you know, there was obviously Three Mile Island, then Chernobyl, and then Fukushima. And it's just like, the you know, the if you're a regulator, what's your risk? Your risk is you approve a project that, that has a problem. It's so much easier just to say no. And we've been really good at saying no in this country. So we at this present, at this time, don't have a singular, singular, single major nuclear plant, you know, a traditional 1000 gigawatt or 2000 gigawatt plant, you know, these big monster plants. We don't have a single one under construction. If you look globally, there's 60 plus, about 20 of which are in China. <clears throat> there is, so, you know, backing up last summer, I was pounding the table in our newsletter and Fortunately for our clients, and, and buying there was the Sprott uranium ETF. As you know, uranium is a monster mood move. Yeah, it's been great. I wish we had Cameco too. We used to own Cameco. We sold out way too early. But the challenge with the uranium is trying to find companies that actually look attractive from a valuation standpoint. Most of them don't make any money. Now, with hundred dollar uranium, hundred plus, that could change pretty radically. And there are some very impressive stock charts out there. So it's it's an area we like. I'm personally invested in a company that's a molten salt, small modular reactor with a bunch of ex navy nuclear because that's a, that's the thing that really kind of proves this works is that these you know the submarines and the aircraft carriers that have been operating on basically smaller. I wouldn't you know the, the word kind of I guess what experts tell me gets misused the term small modular reactors that those guys are not what they're doing today on land. Uh, they're certainly not molten salt. Molten salt, a lot of experts think, is the most attractive next-gen he technology because it's basically walk-away safe. Uh, but it, that's a very complex area, very exciting area. But the bottom line is there's there's a shortage of uranium. And that's uh, I, I think that's going to be a challenge. In fact, what was the Kazakhstan company, Kazakhstan, whatever, that just announced a major shortfall in production and that's created the next up leg in uranium. And it's... Uh, it's a fascinating area, but it's tricky to play. So I don't want to minimize the issues around disposal of nuclear waste, uh, nor the safety issues. No, nobody, <laughs> no, no one wants to have a nuclear crisis, right? We, we, we saw in Chernobyl how horrible it could be in Fukushima most more recently. Um, but the, the reason why I say maybe the government needs to somehow get involved and get this started, I think it's from a national security perspective, like, like you say, we, we, we are going to have an energy crisis. It's just a matter of how soon. What are your thoughts on the economics of a small nuclear reactor, small modular reactors? Because uh, there was there was one company that had one uh, approved to be built in Wyoming, um, and then it got canceled because the cost overruns just became so outrageous. And I think a lot of that could have had to to, you know, to do with supply issues and COVID, but um, the economics don't seem to quite be there yet. Right. And I think you've got a number of people that have gone into that that are not, you know, they're, they're I, I want to be careful, I want to be to cast aspersions because I'm sure they're doing it with good intentions, but some of these people are extremely wealthy and they've thrown hundreds of millions of dollars at projects that probably could have been funded for a lot less money as opposed to the one that 
you know, I'm just a venture capital investor. I'm not on the board or anything like that, but they've accomplished a lot more, a lot more than the other guys, but on a lot less money consumed. I mean, literally, you know, less than $10 million and are ready to, you know, they're, oh, they're wow. very close to first vision. They're small modular reactors that vary in size radically. And then you get into micro reactors. And the reason that matters is that I think one of the other issues about this is the grid. So if you build a big, you know, if you were able to get a, a massive light water reactor built like we used to do and are still operating in, in parts of the country, uh, then how do you get to the power to market? You do the transmission line thing, which is, I mean, the grid is just so overloaded and it's vulnerable. You may have seen this article here recently where the Chinese tried to hack in and, and basically, uh, you know, shut down parts of the grid. And there are concerns about uh, a nuclear device being detonated at the proper altitude that takes out the grid. There's, it could be a massive solar flare as have hap has happened in the past. The grid is vulnerable. One of the advantages of the small modular reactor, especially the micro reactors, is to do distributed power. So you actually have the reactor close to where the need is. And obviously you would, you would focus initially on the most at risk as say military bases, maybe hospitals. So create a local power source you know, from these micro reactors. And because it, the molten salt technology is so safe, and if you really want a fascinating read, there's a the guy that was considered to be the father of the nuclear uh, energy industry, not nuclear you know, bombs and weapons, but nuclear power for civilian use was Alvin Weinberg. And he was at Oak Ridge, Tennessee. And back in the early 60s, they developed a molten salt reactor technology that ran very flawlessly uh, for a number of years, but then kind of lost in a political horse race with uh, you know, that's when Nixon was president and there was a lot of pressure to do the development in California and they wanted to do the big light water reactors. And he warned him, he said, these things are, they're, they're very safe, but they're not totally safe. And he was worried about some of the things that would ultimately happen, like at Three Mile Island and particularly Fukushima. So it's, but it's not perfect. I mean, I've, I've heard some experts criticize, uh, the molten salt technology as being too corrosive, but, you know, my folks are adamant that they've been able to, you know, refine the technology, and it's going to be a very interesting few years, I think, in this field. So I would say stay tuned, and and anybody cares, I'd highly recommend that book by Alvin Weinberg. I'm trying to remember the exact title, but I'm sure you can Google it just off of his name. We'll find it, and we'll put it in the description to our to our interview. Thank you, I appreciate that. So you mentioned China, and we have a mutual friend. <laughs> Yes. Name Louis? <laughs> Name Louis, who is, I would say, one of the West's foremost authorities on uh, that part of the world and investing in that part of the world. So um, if I was going to invest in China, I would do it through Louis. But having said that, I personally think China is uninvestable right now. Um, I think that there's a lot of risks, uh, at, at least to the individual investor. Um what what are your thoughts on on what's going on in China right now? Mainly the the markets. Well, a couple of thoughts, and this is a good lead into one of the, the the main techniques that I've learned the hard way to use, and it's probably the most important thing I'll convey to you in this podcast, which is to look at multi year support levels and resistance levels. So the reason I bring that up in connection with China is if you look at the FXI ETF in the spring of two thousand twenty two it had a major break of multi-year support. And for us, we had been easing out of China anyway because of you know looking at what Xi Jinping was doing, which to us seemed very anti-capitalistic and very anti-American. Yeah, agreed. It was like, you know, we're just not that comfortable with you know, in the crackdown on Hong Kong. And so we were kind of backing out. But when that break happened, that was like, okay, we were out of all our Chinese. So we didn't have that much. And we did okay. I mean, we had some winners and some losers, but we avoided the big damage. It's down 30 plus percent since that support break happened. The ring, I, reason I bring that up is that I think that's, you know, one of the problems that investors have, particularly professional investors that get really invested literally and emotionally into a position is you can ride it down and down and down and down. And there have been a lot of great track records that have been destroyed by that, not having, a, you know, a good sell discipline. And you don't want to, you know, like a five or ten percent stop. If you do that, you're going to be in and out of things all the time. But it's hard to break multi-year support levels. And for us, the the key is three years. Three years is long enough to be meaningful. Longer is better. You know, if it's a ten-year support level or a ten-year resistance level, that's even more meaningful. I'm not the only one that talks about this. If you listen to Paul Tudor Jones, he's constantly talking about look for range expansions. He does. I've never heard him define the time frame. 
And I'm not saying three years is sacrosanct. It just, we found that works. That's long enough to be meaningful. But again, if it's, well, I'll give you a good example. If you were to look at Microsoft. So Microsoft was the, one of the, the key members of the tech bubble in the late nineties. And the tech bubble burst. And from 2000 to 2013, it went nowhere for 13 right. years, even though earnings were growing and growing and growing and growing. So it went from being this very expensive growth stock to a, a deep value stock by the you know, early 2000 teens. And then it broke out in 2013 and boom. And frankly, the same thing happened with the stock market. The S&P went nowhere for 13 years and then it broke out. And the NASDAQ right. went nowhere for, I think, 14 years. It broke it. So, and you can see that with Japan here recently where it had just been in this long range and then finally broke out. And it's just, this keeps happening a time and time again. And the way I really learned this lesson that finally got through my thick skull was in my personal long short account where I'd have stocks that I would short and I'd go, okay, it's making a new three-year high. I don't care. This thing is so overvalued. I'm just going to, and I would just lose money consistently. So I believe me, I paid my dues on this one, but it's uh it's just, it's a great technique to use. And especially when you're in a position like us, where you're constantly, we're, we're beneficiaries of having all this information come our direction from all our contacts and all the analysts that we have. And so when you get this, this overflow of ideas, how do you narrow it down? How do you filter it down to actionable ideas that have a high percentage of succeeding? First thing I do is, okay, is the stock breaking out? And if it is, we get really interested. It's not you know, the end all be all. We also want to have a good fundamental story. I'll you know, throw out a name right now that I think looks quite interesting. This regard is Chubb, CB, the big US you know, property casualty company. And if you know Cy Jacobs, who's a friend of Grant Williams, Sai's got a great story on the insurance industry and that they underpriced at coming out of COVID and now they're raising premium. We all know this, right? We, we yes. see this with our, our premium notices that we're getting. So they've got real pricing power and it's a very high quality company. But you look at the chart and you go, yep, there's something real positive going on there. And so, and then as I said with China, this is almost more important, I think, on the downside is when they break down and they break below that long term support and you go, okay, something's wrong here. I don't care that you know all the analysts tell me not to worry. There's something wrong. Now, does it work every time? No. In fact, one of the one of the biggest flaws with it is when you get a company that, especially a high quality company that goes down, breaks through your support, and then goes down twenty or thirty percent, which they usually do right away. Then somebody buys them out. That happens pretty frequently with a high quality company. So, uh, you know, obviously you don't have that problem when it's breaking out to the upside. But uh, sometimes you get upside breakout fake outs, but not very many. I think we're of the same mind when it comes to, for, for maybe perhaps slightly different reasons uh, when it comes to China. I, I just had this conversation with a very smart uh, investor who I admire quite a bit a couple of weeks ago. And he was saying, you know, I, I, I'm convinced that it, it just can't go, go any lower. China, the Chinese market is, is primed for a bounce. And, um, you know, sh- sure, maybe that's possible, but the trend does not look good. And uh, when you layer on top of that, the risks that you started with, which is that, in my opinion, when you invest in a Chinese company, you're investing alongside the uh, Chinese Communist Party. I don't, I don't want them to be my business partner. That's a great point. I used to always say about Russia, you know, when you're investing in a country where the rule of law, whatever Putin says it is, you know, that's that's a big risk, and the same thing is now true in China. <clears throat> so I think you're exactly right about it. To be fair, I do think, and one of my positives, so I did a kind of a twist on Byron Wien this year, and so I've got several surprises, one, 10 surprises. One of them is that there is detente between the U.S. and China, and that uh, that could trigger a very powerful rally in the Chinese market. And it's certainly, you look at stocks like Alibaba, and it is really, really cheap. But for us, you know, as U.S. RAs, it's tough to invest in China because of the client pushback. And just let's say, I don't think this is going to happen. I know Louis thinks there's virtually no chance, but let's say China were to invite, invade Taiwan or attack Taiwan. I think they'd have a very hard time invading it, but let's say they attacked it. I mean, you, you can get all those stocks frozen. Just like, you know, we had a small position in Luke Oil when Russia invaded uh, Ukraine and we tried to get out. And, you, you, you know, that's the problem. These things happen overnight. You can't get out. And it's, you know, someday I think that thing's going to be worth a fortune, but. In the meantime, it's you know sits there at zero on the on the statement, and you go, wow, do I really want to take that risk? And but that said, I think there there could be a very powerful trading rally coming out of China soon. But in the but I would probably sell into it if it happens. I guess it all comes down to where you think the best risk reward ratio is. Uh, you, you mentioned Japan. That's a market. Um, yeah, I don't want to 
say it's a blob, right? There's it, 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 there, there, there's a lot to look at there. But on the whole, I think that the Japanese market is pretty interesting right now. What are what are your thoughts? Is that an area that you that you like and you're investigating? We love it. We've loved it for a while. The problem for U.S. investors has been that while the stocks have done great, the yen has been so weak that you haven't made as much. You made money, but you should have made a lot more money. So one of the ways we're com- combating that is that you can buy the yen ETF. I mean, there is a currency yen out there. And so we own you know a decent amount of that. I would highly recommend. I think the yen is just severely undervalued. I'm not sure when it's going to move because they are, they're moving very – they're easing slowly out of yield curve control. They're not doing as rapidly as some people thought they might. But uh, I think those stocks look better. You know, Buffett went in there about two years ago. He bought the, the big com- commodity traders in Japan, and those would look great on a chart. They were breaking out when he did it, and sure enough, they've kept on running. Uh, I think a company, we don't own it, but I think Komatsu looks pretty interesting. I, I know Louis believes that there's going to be a lot of infrastructure uh, activity in particularly Southern Asia. And, uh, and I think that even in the United States with uh, – you know, the build out, the reindustrialization of America. And with, you know, the yen being as cheap as it is, that gives them a major competitive advantage. So, yes, I think there's some definite plays in Japan and it's been good to us. But, uh, yeah, it's, you know, when you see a market that I mean, it, it top, topped out in 1990, you know, and it, and it took until a couple of years ago for it to break out of that long, long range. And so it's there's there's a lot of kind of embedded value. It's been a you know, classic coiled spring type of a, a situation. I like to end some of my uh, interviews where I speak with investors that I, that I respect and admire, and you're at the top of that list. Thank you. Uh, wh- what's, the, what's the question that I should have asked you that I didn't? The thing I just don't hear very much about is what the deficit spending, we know the deficit's just out of control, right? Two trillion at double, that, I mean, that really surprised me that we would go from one trillion to two trillion. And people say, oh, yeah, look, why haven't we had a recession? Well, it's hard to have a recession when you have that kind of fiscal stem. And then, of course, you've had the financial market easing that's happened here lately with interest rates way down, credit spreads narrowing drastically. So you've had the, I mean, for a while it was like monetary drag versus fiscal stem. And now you've got both of them. And even though the Fed hasn't officially cut, they let the markets do all the easing for them. And it was, you know, that, that one two punch of lower rates and tighter spreads is, that's, that's rocket fuel. Uh, so, what what I where I'm going with this is I just don't see any research on okay what would U.S. corporate earnings be if the deficit was at a more normal two or three percent level of GDP you know instead of two trillion it was you know three hundred four hundred five or six million something like that billion I should say not million it's billion uh, it would have I don't know I mean I, I keep asking people that are smarter than me what would that delta be but it would be a lot and you, you would think that the market should trade at a lower multiple because of that low quality of earnings, right? It's just, that's not, we, we know for sure that's not sustainable. And to, to just think about this, Ed, again, I don't hear this from anybody else, but if you were to compare the federal deficit to the S&P 500 earnings, it's about a push. In other words, all the S&P 500 wow. earnings are just about what the federal deficit is. I mean, that, that's just nuts. That's now, amazing. if it was a recession, if it was a recession, you'd say, okay, well, that's normal because earnings go down. Federal spending goes up. We've got sub four percent employment. Unemployment. We supposedly have an economy that's growing at four to five percent a quarter. I guess uh, the Atlanta GDP now is just back over four percent for this quarter again. I don't think it's that strong. It doesn't make sense to me. But let's just say, I mean, it's at least a decent economy. This, this we've never seen anything like this. And for everybody that I hear the you know the, the bulls are in charge right now on CNBC, and there's a lot of you know victory dances happening, but. What's going to happen when that, and I think it's going to be the bond market that that's puts an end to that. And they sort of did last year, and then it's kind of been able, been able to get away with it with some tricks that Janet Yellen's played. But anyway, I, that's what I'd really be watching. I think the number one risk to everything is a bond market riot. And I think we're closer to that than than almost everybody on Wall Street believes. It is the uh, question we've been asking for years now, right? Is, is what, when will the debt finally matter? And the longer that answer gets pushed out, I fear the worse it's going to be. Well, I don't know if you know this one. If you, if you look at what's called the four ends, so it's negative net, uh, four, N, 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 S. So negative net national savings. We've gone negative on that basis to the tune that we're now using up all the domestic savings and also all the imported foreign savings. So basically the funding of, the, of our trade deficit. It's only happened eight other times in the last century. 
Four of them were, well, this is the eighth time, four of them were in the Great uh, Depression, three were in the Great Recession. Again, for th- that would sort of make sense under, you know, extreme economic distress. But when you're in the conditions like now, it's like, that's, that's totally insane. And we're at, you know, the federal interest budgets or dep- uh, outflow is going up to about a trillion. So we're paying about a trillion dollars in interest right now. So the idea that we can just keep skating along, uh, I think that's a delusion. So you think the bond market is uh, is what brings it to an end, and then what <laughs> what does it look like after? And now now I'm doing it to you. I'm doing the I think I'm giving you an I think question. Apologies. Well, we we have to be very creative, and you know, frankly, I think we're going to have to have a, a whole new political leadership class, which is a very fourth turning like belief. I mean, that's kind of what happens is in fourth turning, the people that led you into the crisis are not going to be the ones that lead you out. And I think that's so true in this case. I think we really need to look at what did Weimar Republic do back in you know in the early 20s to get out of their hyperinflation. We're, we're not going to have hyperinflation, but I just think all roads to lead to re- inflation, given the situation that we're in right now, which will then require some very different remedies. Like you know, perhaps we have to have a uh, uh, bonds which are guaranteed by the amazing physical assets that America owns. I mean, we are a very blessed country in so many ways. The other thing that's interesting, Ed, and I could send you this where you go to the Fed website, is if you look at household wealth since the pandemic hit, apparently, I don't quite believe it. In fact, I really don't believe it at all. But they say it's increased by $45 trillion. So U.S. household net worth is $145 trillion now versus $100 trillion. Then. If, if that's the case, we really should be able to figure out a solution. I mean, that $45 trillion of extra wealth, I know some of inflation took away maybe half of it, but still, there's, I guess really where I'm going at, at some point, I think we have to have a very uh, effective estate tax. I know John Malden thinks it's going to be a VAT. Maybe it's going to be a combination of it, but we're going to have the biggest asset transfer ever because of my generation passing away. And we're the ones that have these, you know, most of the $145 trillion we own. And you know, even if you have only a 25% tax rate with no loopholes, a state tax rate, you could get, bring in tens of trillions of dollars. And we need it, <laughs> frankly. The key to what you just said is the no loopholes. Um, yeah, exactly. I, I, <laughs> that's a whole nother global macro update conversation. So we won't go down that rabbit hole. But David, I always appreciate the time that I spend with you. Thank you so much for for giving us some today. Uh, It's always a pleasure to see you. Likewise. Let's do this again soon. Sounds good.